welcome everybody to the state of creators in the fashion industry. Let me start by introducing our great panelists here. Let's start with Estrella, who is heading up all of Walmart Creator. She's been with Walmart for five years now, was recently promoted to this role, previously heading up affiliate marketing at Walmart, um, no small feat. Previous to Walmart, she was with Who, What, Where at Click Brands. Next, we have Jacob Hawkins, who is the CMO of Forever 21. Prior to Forever 21, he was with Groupon and Belk, heading up all of digital and marketing. And last but certainly not least, we have Angelique, who is the founder and CEO of Ave Advisory and previously the head of marketing at Allo Yoga. So thank you everyone for coming to this session. I see a couple of people are still trickling in, but we'll go ahead and, and get into it. Um, so my first question would be for Jacob. Jacob, um, Forever 21 is going through a big transition, a very positive transition. Uh, the stores have a completely new merchandise selection. How are you use, utilizing creators to usher in this new chapter of Forever 21? How are you inviting people to this new uh, momentous occasion for the brand? Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Happy Friday Eve. I'm excited <laughs> to be here. Um, it's an exciting time at Forever 21. We're in the middle of a transformation, as you talked about. Um, we brought in a new leadership team, we've redesigned our product, we've reimagined the store experience, and now we've got to get the word out there, and creators are such an important part of that. You know, historically, we would go out there and spend millions and millions of dollars to try to put our message in front of customers, and now we co-partner with these creators, and we bring them in, and, and they're an important part of our message, and how that message comes to life is actually influenced and even driven by these creators. And so it's a critical piece of what we're doing. We've recently actually changed the way we go to market and we're doing it all in a social first um, way where we actually have integrated social deeply into marketing and they're part of everything we do. When we go to launch a, a, a season, like today we launched our holiday season, that season was social first. We brought social influencers in, they were involved. We have our brand strategy and underneath that, we said, here's what we're trying to do. And we gave them the product and let them help us bring the, that product and those messages to life. And we're so excited about how that all came forward. And so they're a critical piece of our, our, our message. Awesome. A follow-up question to that would be, you know, so at my time at ColourPop, one of the things we really believed in is in this new age of digital with creators, your brand is not so much what you say it is and what your marketing team says it is in silo. It's really what the community says it is and how creators describe your brand. Can you talk a little bit about that, about um, what you're thinking about Forever 21 and then how the creators describe it and how you're, how you're bridging that together? Yeah. So one of the things that surprised us is in one of my past lives, we would go out there and create these beautiful pictures and we'd post them. And we'd look at the amount of, of interaction we would get, and it was so much less than having a, um, an influencer go out there or a creator go out there and actually put a, a picture up that frankly didn't look as good as this tailored picture, but it looked authentic. And so that's a critical piece is having the, these, generate, the, these influencers out there speaking and talking about it, it makes the message authentic. Um, it allows them to push that message out to their millions and millions of followers and just allows you to amplify that message. So I think there's an authenticity piece and I think that there's a, an amplification piece that comes from, from working with them. Yeah, and that leads me to my next question. So um, I think that's that's been a big difference and a big pivot in the last six to seven years is kind of letting go of really polished marketing campaigns that are created in silo with a, a, a couple of in-house marketing minds. Not that those don't have a time and place, but I think creator assets do. So my question to all three of you, and I'll start with Estrella, is, you know, we all know the power of earned media. I think everyone in this room knows the magic that is earned media. But can you tell me how earned media assets and creators have powered your paid and owned media lanes and give us some examples? Yeah, absolutely. I feel like earned media and the organic content that we see out in the wild is one of the biggest data points and signals we have to our casting strategy and who we should work with on paid and extensions and amplification. So I think it's really important that the creator is a strong brand fit and that their audience is really resonating with what they're putting out there. Especially for Walmart, we want to make sure that the audience is having a positive reaction, that they appreciate the Walmart content. And so when we see a piece of content out there that is already doing really well organically, that's a great signal to us to work with this content creator in a paid capacity, to have them host a live stream on our site, to work with them in a paid partnership 
invite them to an exclusive event and really get to know the brand even better. And so we really use that organic content as a key data signal for casting and who to work with. Yeah, sim similarly, I think EMV is the single most important KPI in marketing overall. And literally, once again, the single most important KPI in marketing overall. If you are putting assets out, whatever the field may be, right? It might be paid ads, affiliate, working with partners and creating content. If that is not laddering back up to your larger brand ethos, who you are, what you stand for, then there's absolutely no way that your community can lean in and understand if this brand or this product is meant for them. And so really stemming in from a place of EMV and understanding both content that's created from the creator standpoint or UGC and advocacy and community standpoint and how that ladders back into who you are. Um, we typically see a higher ROAS, higher ROI across the board because once again, this has been performing in EMV. And I see that across the board for all of my clients. Um, so use that as a North Star. Yes, I'm so, so glad you touched on that. So um, for in-house days at Seed Beauty, we saw a similar correlation. EMV was correlated to all the bottom funnel harder metrics and across our current clients, we see the same thing. The lag uh, is sometimes a little bit different. You know, it's not an, an immediate, you see a pop in EMV and you see sales pop that day. Uh, there might be a three month lag, a six month lag, a few week lag, but what that correlation is and what that multiple is, is existent for every brand. Um, I am curious too, so you saw you uh, saw an increase in your ROAS, probably a decrease in your CPA. Yeah. Um, do you see the same, Estrella, Jacob, when, you, when your EMV grows, when your community size grows, can you tie that back to the harder metrics? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, in the retail business, we're extremely sales driven, right? So we're constantly looking at every part of the funnel, but we really do see that we've been able to scale our influencer programming because these creators have deep influence, or deep influence over what our customers are purchasing, and we really do see it both at the top and definitely at the bottom, especially as affiliate is a big backbone of a lot of our creator partnerships. And so we're able to really see the return on ad spend and to see significant uh, revenue driven from these creators who are also driving EMV. And I'd say yes and no, and here's <laughs> why. I've been at a retailer where ha nearly half of their volume was coming from their digital channel and you could track it all, it was very easy. And so as we started investing in some of these things that drove more store traffic with EMV, which it does a lot of, we could see it very clearly because, you know, 40, 50% of it was coming digital. I'm at a retailer now where the vast majority of our volume comes through our stores. And you can't track that. And so we've actually seen, like when I came in, we have a marketing budget and it was all going into this lower funnel work. And as we've shifted over and done more social and done more, more of this um, earned media and PR, it's driving a lot of traffic to stores, but that's not always trackable. And so I think you, ha you can't just look at the metrics of like, what's your return on ad spend or what's your media as a percent of sales. You have to look holistically and you know, having, having the right customer data platform so you can track what's happening in stores is, is super important as well. I agree, Jacob. I think what's really interesting, especially in the marketing field, which we're, we're obviously all a part of, it's so easy for us to get locked up on metrics and understand, okay, is there ROI here? What does that look like? And oftentimes in marketing, we are short-sighted. We'll try to see, okay, I haven't seen an impact today. Maybe we need to optimize. What does that look like? We give ourselves a month, three months. You know, in terms of some of the biggest brand partnerships that we've seen in my career, um, even if it was, you know, necessarily um, at big box retailers or brands that solves, uh, some big plays that are brand and traffic driving, but really brand making, some of them are years in the making, right? It might be nine months, 12 months, 18 months. And the biggest mistake I think we make as marketers is look at short term kind of quick wins. Um, and that's just not the case. Like driving to store, you're not able to track that. You're not able to track the earned media, the PR, the, um, the cultural zeitgeist that you're bringing in. And so important for us to also sometimes remove ourselves and understand what is the sentiment? How are we showing up? What is the community? And how do we keep growing in a way that maybe isn't trackable too? Love that answer. And I think, you know, having a, a view on short-term metrics and short-term performance is the quickest way to put your entire marketing budget into Facebook ads. And we know how that ended with a 
a lot of D to C brands. So very thoughtful. You touched on something, Angelique, that I want to dive a little deeper into, which is expanding community and growing that community size. That's a ground game. That's something that takes a very long time to do. I'd love to hear, with your time at Allo, how did you guys approach net new community onboards, and where was that in terms of priority within the program? Community is at the core of everything Allo does, and so it is the number one priority in every single thing that we do, amongst also being social first. And um, it really started from a place of how do we ensure that we authentically and genuinely show up within communities that might be wellness-based, yoga-based, um, spiritual wellness and well-being based before even fashion based and creating really in-depth meaningful relationships with the community that was using our product whether in studio whether they're part of yoga teacher training programs and so on and so forth um, getting their feedback on product getting their feedback on go-to-market um, it's really interesting to see there's about 4,000 yogis that activate every single month with every single drop it might be twice a month but for sure at least once a month. And again, all of that is organic, but that's just because of the love and power and support that we've put in via equipment or you know, just supporting their practice via maybe Allo Moves or clothing and you name it. Um, that has come to be what it is today, um, let alone not even mentioning on the fashion side of things and on the trend side of things. And now we have, or Allo has wellness clubs right, where you come and it's a gym, you can do IV drips, cold plunges, there's air one on tap, that type of thing. All of that, again, is organic. There's no paid, it's not a paid gym. It's really a content creation engine, but really a community engine where folks can come and really enjoy and live and breathe everything that is aloe, similar to the experiences like the aloe houses we had done in the past. So um, again, community is just at the core. And now, again, not a short-term type of activation, but within a few years, yes. the ROI is there. But yes. there wasn't at the beginning, and it was really just to nurture that that intrinsic community that is why Allo was started. Yes, and it sure did pay off. Estrella, I wanna talk about onboarding community for Walmart Creator. How do you go about sourcing net new community members, and how do you get them bought in to what you're up to and bought into promoting the brand? Yeah, of course. I mean, I think a big part of it is what we were touching on earlier. So really making sure we're living on social and finding people who are talking about us organically, looking through TikTok, searching Walmart finds, who is who's promoting product and telling this story already in a really authentic way, because those always end up being our most successful long-term partnerships, as I touched on earlier. Um, it's definitely a little bit of an art and a science. Like, like you said, you really need the manpower and the team to build those relationships one-on-one. -on -one. Um, but with the Walmart Creator Program, we're really trying to also build tools and technology that enable us to automate that skill in some ways and balancing that with our team's personal touch. So I think that we're really finding the balance between giving self-serve tools that allow creators and empower them to run their business with Walmart and run their partnership with Walmart in an always-on, easy way, but also always making sure that we have the team there to get on the phone with them, to answer any questions, to explain any new brands we have that we think they might like based on their content, because I think a lot of it is that educational piece as well. So we make sure that our team really balances their time between building the tools, but also having the conversations face-to-face -face and really one by one um, with the creators that are interested in having more face time and enabling them to have that connection with someone and a face behind a big brand. On that, I want to touch up on your team structure. So are you, do you have a segment of your team that's focused on community acquisition and then a different segment on community retention and tools? How does that, how is that structured? Yeah, absolutely. I think it's equally important to have both, right? So we definitely have team members that are focused on onboarding creators onto the program, discovering new talent, nurturing those relationships. And those conversations are, to your point, really educational at first and finding the right fit. What you know, asking the right questions to the creator, what's been your favorite most successful partnership, and then tailoring the conversations to them to get them on board. Um, and then definitely retention, I think one of the most important things throughout my entire career in creator marketing has been retaining these long-term partnerships. And then once you find those people who really work for your brand and who capture that magic and are able to drive you know, magic across the funnel, um, it's really important to nurture those and to make sure that you keep them happy, that they feel fulfilled and excited by the partnership again, goes back to constantly asking them for their feedback and making sure that you're building, not just getting a thousand influencers into the door, but really finding and, and cultivating amazing relationships with them long-term as well. 
That leads me to my next question for all three of you. What tech to support creator communities are you most bullish on for the next five years? Jacob, I want to start with you. Tech to support creators. Um, so there, I, I would say a couple things. One of the things that we've, sh we've struggled with when we first started approaching this is how do you manage hundreds and thousands of relationships with all these creators out there? And for us, you, we had to go out there and get a really good system that allowed us to actually set up who are we reaching out to, how are we doing this. There are agencies that, that can go out there and do a lot of that work for you, but we didn't want to let that go. We wanted to actually control that, make sure that the people that we were bringing in and the conversations that we were bringing to life were authentic and that were, were where we wanted them to be. And so we went out there and got tech that allowed us to go out and do a lot of that work. And I think that that's been a really um, critical piece of us kind of getting our arms around that and being able to hit the right, the right people. So that's been a, a, an interesting one. When you look five years out, there's a lot coming down the pipeline. Um, one of the things that we do is we do these brand collaborations. So like with the launch of the Barbie movie this summer, we actually went out there and built a special brand Barbie collaboration with Mattel. And we had a, th this amazing lineup of product. And one of the interesting things we did is we actually put that stuff into the metaverse as well. And so I really like the whole virtual piece of technology. We actually went out, we built um, sister virtual pieces of these, the physical line that we built. And you could buy the physical line. And for your avatar, you could actually buy the, the virtual line and you could twin it if you wanted to. And for this last one, one thing that we did that was really interesting is we actually did these pop-up shops. And we were able to go and allow game creators to take these Barbie pop-up shops, Forever 21 Barbie pop-up shops, and put them within their game. So envision this, you know, you've got this 15-year-old kid running through this, this game, and all of a sudden they come around the corner, and here's a Forever 21 Barbie pop-up shop. And they could go in there and actually try on the product. So I, the, the whole virtual piece from a technology standpoint, I think is really interesting. And we were able to go out there and reach 300 million people came in and actually interact with that experience in a virtual experience. Wow, incredible. Um, Angelique, what tech are you most bullish on? I'm really excited about technologies and platforms that encourage and enable content creators, influencers, community, really just all users, to create content in a seamless way that feels genuine to them, genuine to their um, audiences. And so whether that be platforms like the TikToks and Instagrams and Snaps of the world, or whether that be tools that allow for them to share that content readily, you know, accessibly with brands. Um, I'm bullish on both of those. I also am a huge fan of leaning more and more into nano and micro influencers, right? And getting to a place where you might have 900 followers, but they're 900 of your closest friends and you might be a big kind of influencer within your small circle and network. And that has so much more meaning than someone who might have 49 million followers. Um, and so how do they get their content out there and how do they connect with brands? I think that's really exciting um, amidst also being able as a brand to search for those creators. Yeah, I would echo their sentiment. There's obviously so much new amazing technology that's coming out and so much to keep up with. but. What truly gets me the most excited about our industry is really the people, more so than the tech. I feel like there's more and more creators establishing themselves every year, making higher and higher quality content, driving more and more influence over customers. And so I think the groundswell and the power of the creators is really what's driving the creator economy. And there's platforms that are cool one day, out the next. At the end of the day, these creators are the lifeblood of what's powering that technology and those platforms. And if you go where they are, you're always going to be in the right place. So as we're building technology at Walmart for creators, I'm really focused on what they need, what they want at the moment, and asking them, going back to those personal relationships, always asking them the questions of what tech can we build to help make your life easier and to help you create more content on whatever platform and whatever reality, physical or virtual, whatever it might be. Because I think if you're building the tech for them and asking them what makes them excited, I think you'll always be building for the right place and for the future. Yes. And Estrella, so Walmart Creator famously has no following threshold for the creators that you'll onboard into your program. What would surprise us the most about Micro and Nano's contributions to Walmart Creator? I find it really interesting that I feel like in our industry, there tends to be these like sweeping generalizations of like, Nano creators are amazing, or Macro creators are really powerful for awareness. But I 
I've actually found that there's never a true general statement like that that you can make to, to be the case. So for example, there's macro creators that are incredible at driving sales and awareness, and there's macro creators who we really don't see as big of a lift from. And then the same is true for nano and micro creators. And so what I'm really focused on is finding the right creators who are naturally excited about Walmart, who have an engaged audience who's excited for them to share their favorite products from Walmart. And really then being able to tell that authentic brand story, no matter the following size, if those two things are true, it will convert, it will work well. And so I think we really try to stay away from, from making those distinctions or those lines in the sand and really look for who the creator is, what type of content they're making, and then in terms of inclusivity across follower size, I think we're also really keen and excited on inclusivity across all categories. I think obviously fashion, home, and beauty has been a big area of focus for us, but with Walmart and our, our really broad assortment, there's so many creators that are underserved in different niches. You know, We have everything from an arts and crafts DIY teacher who can work and, and be within our program and really monetize sharing her favorite crafting products from Walmart or whatever it might be, and so I think Looking across the gamut of all follower sizes, all categories and niches is truly what we've seen be successful as long as there's an authentic fit and the audience likes it as well. I wanna talk a little bit about the balance between paid and organic creator relationships and partnerships. Angelique, a question for you is, can you describe with your time at Allo the most impactful paid partnership that you did? Who was it with? Why was it the most impactful? How did you define it as such? Yeah, I think people would be surprised to know how many paid partners there are. Um, there are only 82 aid partners that we've ever worked with in the last three years. And um, 82, right? When you think of the hundreds of thousands of people that post a year for Allo, they're all organic. And so I know the question is, who's been the most impactful on the paid front? But just knowing those numbers, I would even just guide the conversation to knowing that the highest impact has been in organic relationships. Um, but back to those 82 over the last three years, you know, you think of big brand builders, um, again, back to the conversation of EMV and that being kind of the driver that I always have as a marketer at Allo or not, right, with some of my other clients. Um, it's really about who's on brand and who's creating content that resonates both the look and feel but the ethos of what the brand stands for. And so I never really care about swipe ups. I don't give a shit about traffic. I That is not why I you know, work with them or that we work with them as a brand. It's really because they are able to be an extension of what the brand is and who they stand for. Um, so going back to big partnerships in like the 82 people realm, I would say a few years ago probably would have said someone like a Kendall Jenner, you know, was really great for just, she was authentically wearing us to form a Pilates and, you know, there was paparazzi shots of her wearing us out and about. Same thing with someone like a Jimmy Butler, right, in the NBA. They just love wearing the brand organically and seeing a sustained organic wear with a ton of press around them, again, in unpaid manners, it then makes sense to bring them into the fold um, for campaign and for, you know, e-com imagery and billboard imagery and that sort of thing. Um, but really at the core, it's back to those hundreds of thousands of folks that are unpaid, including those two names that were unpaid for a very long um, amount of time. I love that you touched on that. I think that's one of the most common missteps I see is I'll see some brands say, well, this person's talking about me organically. Why, why would I pay them? And that is not the flex that you think it is. You want to reward the most, the highest contributing community members with paid deals. Jacob, I would love to ask you the same question. What has been the most impactful paid partnership that Forever 21 has done? Yeah, so earlier this year, we launched a Juicy Couture collaboration and we are looking for the right content creator, influencer who could help us bring this to life. And our CEO's daughter said, Mom, you got to check out this Alex Earl. And was just talking about Alex Earl, who was just on the verge of blowing up. And so we saw her, we reached out. In 24 hours, we'd contacted her. We actually signed her. And she came on as the face of, of the content creator for this Juicy Couture. She modeled in all the product. Um, we were able to go out there and do a campaign. We launched it. It blew up. It was very, very successful. But what was interesting is while we got millions, you know, five, six, seven million views and thousands of comments on it, so many people picked that up and wrote stories. We pushed that over into our press arm. We ended up getting four billion impressions or media impressions 
over that collaboration and how it was just a match made in heaven. And so it just was really interesting when you get it right and do it. It's just amazing how viral it becomes. You're really happy with that. Wow. And yeah. Australia. We have so many amazing paid partnerships. It really is hard to pick one, but one that stood out to me from this year was with a fashion creator named Mary Orden. As I was touching on a little bit earlier, Walmart has really been making strides in our style assortment. So elevating our fashion home and beauty lines and making sure that we're pushing the assortment to really be on trend and to give the customer what they want and what they're looking for there. And this creator, we, we contracted her to talk about our free assembly line, which is one of our private label new lines that we have an amazing designer, Brandon Maxwell. He's the creator, creative director over the line. And when we reached out to her, we had a pretty general brief, and she's like, I actually have a really good story about how I discovered this brand. Um, do you mind if I tell it? We're like, of course, that's perfect. And she told a really great story about how she was out at dinner in New York City, and her friend walked in wearing this amazing dress that stopped her in her tracks, and she was like, I must know, where did you get that dress? And she was really shocked when, she, when her friend told her that it was from this collection, Free Assembly at Walmart, and that was a true story that she experienced, and I think... She then goes on to say after that she went on to look into it and to run to the bathroom in the restaurant and go on the app and look into the items and then goes into the latest like try on haul that was the, the more sponsored part of our post. But that video got millions and millions of views and, and the best part was that in the comments there were so many similar stories of people saying like this just happened to me last week or don't give away our secrets, we don't want people to know about this collection. And so it actually launched a few great press stories. One that stands out was in the New York Post that said, why New York's fashion women are secretly wearing Walmart. And so I think it was a really great story that kind of told itself without us having to write it or brief it in a scripted way. And so again, to the point that when you, when you let someone tell their story organically, it was great that thousands of other women had the same story in the comments and it kind of was, we couldn't have planned it better if we tried. Oh my gosh, I love that story, that's amazing. Um, that leads me to my last, last, last question. Um, and you touched on this, which is uh, briefing creators and how much to brief them, how much to just let them do their thing. I always say, if you're hiring an artist, let them paint, don't give them a paint by numbers. But I'm curious your guys' approach on that. So I think you touched on it, Estrella. Angelique, I'd love to hear your perspective on how tightly to brief creators. Yeah, controversial take. I hate briefs. I think earlier in my career, I loved them. I was so specific. There was the objectives, the KPIs. It was all laid out. And now I absolutely hate them. I don't want to see one. I don't want to give one out to a creator. If I'm hiring you, and again, as you now know, I don't hire that many folks, I want you to do your thing. And if you're excited and interested and passionate about what we're building, right, no matter the brand or company, I want you to lean in and really be able to do you. Um, so a fan of no briefs at all. And of course, there are exceptions, right? Especially if it's like a sales time or a period where there's like one key, key, key moment. Um, but try not to do them, um, nor the exceptions, nor the briefs. Awesome. And Jacob, just to touch on the Alex Earl story, how tightly was she briefed for that viral moment? With many of these content creators, it doesn't matter if you brief them, they're going to do what they're going to do. And, and, and I just think a lot of it comes down to you've got to pick the right people. And if you pick the right people that represent who you are, it's, the magic's going to happen. You, you don't need to brief. I love that. Well, let's end it there. Thank you for coming, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.